Hi, my name is Chris Anders, and I am here to lead the Creating and Using Synthetic Data for Computer Vision Applications presentation that the Rendered AI and NVIDIA team delivered for CPPR 2022. Today we're basically going to do a recap of the presentation that we gave live. There were some uh, audiovisual recording problems, and we're happy to do a condensed version for uh, an at-home audience. We're going to cover uh, an introduction to physics-based synthetic data, discuss running an experiment with synthetic data in NVIDIA Tau. We're going to talk about developing a synthetic data channel, which is basically a synthetic data application inside rendered AI. And then we're, we'll discuss how to extend synthetic data workflows. The presenters today are myself, Chris Andrews, Katia from NVIDIA, who is our guest presenter, Dan, uh, uh, the our lead solution engineer at Rendered, Sam, who is a release engineer here at Rendered, and then Matt, a senior software developer here at Rendered. I am the CEO and head of product for Rendered AI. I have a couple decades experience in, in product development, product management, and, uh, and leading uh, startup groups both inside larger companies and then uh, at small companies. My focus uh, historically has been in 3D, geospatial, and a variety of domains related to geospatial. Katia uh, joins us from NVIDIA. She is a senior data scientist. She has a PhD in computer science and, uh, and a master's in media informatics. Uh, she is, has specialized in solving computer vision and video analytics problems using AI. And these days she's traveling the world uh, basically presenting on uh, NVIDIA Tau and other NVIDIA data science tools, and she's helping customers solve problems every day. Dan is our lead solutions engineer, and he has about 10 years experience in the geospatial industry. Uh, he's a subject matter for us in remote sensing, 3D, and then feature extraction from 3D data. Matt uh, joined us as a senior software engineer. Um, Matt has uh, several years of experience overseeing AI-based product applications, and he's got a, a bunch of experience in machine learning uh, development and a background in physics. And Sam is our release engineer. Uh, she has six years of uh, full stack experience as a software engineer. Um, she's got a BS in computer science, and she's studying for her MS right now. The key points that we want would like you to take away from today's class include the rationale for using synthetic data, definition of physics-based synthetic data, which is what we focus on, roles and skills for uh, staff who are going to be developing synthetic data, typical workflows for success, benefits of using a platform for data generation, and then examples of actual synthetic data applications. Rendered AI uh, offers a platform as a service for synthetic data that enables data scientists to overcome the costs and challenges of acquiring and using real data for training machine learning and artificial intelligence. We're headquartered in Bellevue, Washington with all remote operations. We have a subscription-based uh, hosted platform that was released late last year, and we focus on computer vision use cases, including uh, generating x-ray images, satellite data, life sciences, and much, much more. For the purposes of the live class, uh, we asked folks to go to Rendered AI, uh, click the get, get Started button, and then sign in to register for an account using the content code shown here. That should still work uh, after the class. You also uh, should sign up for an account with NVIDIA NGC because uh, there will be some tools used through NGC in parts of the demos. One note was that you must have a Google account to use Vertex AI, which is part of one of the demos. Okay. As I'm sure most of you know, data access is one of the fundamental levers of AI. Uh, we see that rare events and edge cases can be extremely hard to find in real sensor data. Uh, there are often data labeling problems. It's not only expensive, but sometimes just hard or even impossible for humans to identify and manually label uh, uh, features or classify uh, areas within imagery. And then some data is just simply not human readable. For example, radar images, uh, IR, and then other uh, non-visible light spectra 
can be really difficult for humans to label. Lack of data can be a barrier to innovation. In many cases, we're finding customers who want to experiment with data sets for future sensors or scenarios that simply don't yet exist, so for which they cannot yet collect data. And then, of course, uh, in broader parts of the industry, we're seeing a lot of information about restricted or high-risk data, Gartner calls it radioactive data, that, uh, that is really difficult to use for, uh, for AI training without risk. And that can include security, medical data, uh, PII-based data sets, things like payroll or legal information, and even things such as faces, and in some cases, even houses or other identifying uh, marks or possessions of people. Synthetic data has the potential to solve the AI data problem. Uh, synthetic data is essentially engineered data that an AI interprets as if it is real data. And what we're seeing in the industry is that Gartner and, uh, and many other publication groups believe that synthetic data is going to be used for a significant amount of the data used to train AI, both in the next couple of years and, and even increasing in the long run. And, and as Forbes said in their recent article, the net effect of the rise of synthetic data will be to empower a whole new generation of AI upstarts and unleash a wave of AI innovation. As I said in the last slide, we see that data as a critical limiting factor, even for just innovation around how to use AI in the future. We are seeing lots of news about synthetic data. Uh, there's increasing uh, activity around investment and acquisitions, executive thought leadership, uh, especially from larger companies such as Amazon and NVIDIA, uh, uh, Meta, and many others. There are more and more proof points coming out every year. And then, of course, we're seeing more technology developed around synthetic data creation. When we talk about synthetic data at Rendered, we are specifically talking about physics-based data that emulates uh, real sensor-captured data from the field. For example, this could be passively captured data such as video or camera imagery, uh, hyperspectral imagery from a satellite sensor, uh, or and many other uh, passive uh, capture domains. It can also include more active, uh, active sensors such as radar. We actually have our own physics-based SAR simulator, for example. Rendered AI can technically be used to generate any kind of synthetic data, but our initial focus has been on physics-based synthetic data generation for CV workflows. Typical output from the rendered AI platform includes 2D imagery, 3D models, uh, additional 2D and 3D content, metadata, and annotation that is used to train AI models. If we look at today's AI workflow, what we often see is that customers are focused on basically scraping together the data that they can find or buy to train the algorithms, test them, and then basically get get what they get. Uh, there's a variety of, of um, manipulation that can go on with real data sets to try to improve AI training, but at the end of the day, you're limited by what's in your data. This can be expensive. Uh, it can have unpredictable data acquisition costs. It can be difficult to train on inconsistent data. When you test uh, and validate using real data sets, you often have to split up the amount of real data that you have, which even further reduces the, the utility of the data. And then fundamentally, your results are limited to what you can achieve with real data sets. We see that tomorrow's AI workflow incorporates synthetic data in a much more iterative workflow that basically starts out by enabling a user to create data, train algorithms on it, test the algorithms, and then compare data sets to see if they then need to go modify uh, their data creation pattern and then create more data. One of the ways that we often start out working with customers is to ask, what is the ideal data set that you think you need to start off this process? This allows the customer to start out from a position where they're going to be able to generate a very inexpensive, unlimited data sets that are 100% accurately labeled Real data sets can be used for comparison and post-processing, and then data can be designed for edge or impossible cases and for removing bias. Many customers come to us and conceptually believe that synthetic data generation works by taking a simulator, building data sets, and then training AI models, and then going away and being very happy with the result. Unfortunately, what we've seen over and over is that this simply doesn't work. 
What we find is that individual data sets don't solve the entire problem that a customer is looking for. Often the initial data sets that are developed don't actually work for what the customer believes that they're, tr they're trying to, uh, you know, for, for the customer's training problem. Synthetic data capabilities, as we've observed, must be continuously improved and extended, and successful users need an iterative workflow. For us then, this tends to break down into three different components. We see a new role in the market called the synthetic data engineer, basically driving world building and simulation capabilities for the customer. We then uh, see that synthetic data applications built by the synthetic data engineer will be deployed to manage compute, which is where platforms like Render come in. And then we see data scientists being able to easily generate data set jobs, retrieve data sets, conduct quality assessment, and then train AI models. And from there, if they need more changes to the, to the, the simulation uh, tools that, that have been built, they can then work with synthetic data engineers to, to drive more variability or more post-processing effects or other things into the world building and simulation that, um, that goes on to, to create synthetic data. Through this iterative process is how we see customers arriving at improved and explainable outcomes that actually solve the problems that they're trying to address. We believe a job of the future is going to be something called a synthetic data engineer. As Gartner is saying, if a ton of data in the future used to train AI, in fact, they believe most data in the future used to train AI will be synthetic, there must be therefore a job role, a job function for someone who will be engineering that data. Synthetic data engineers are likely to be designing and engineering data sets to achieve specific business focused AI outcomes. They will often be software development oriented. They'll be used to things like uh, iterating in development activities by using tools like Python. They may be familiar with certain data science skills and toolkits. They may be familiar with things like 3D or game engines. These, these synthetic data engineers may also have specific vertical industry expertise, for example, in healthcare or other life sciences or remote sensing or many other vertical domains that use computer vision. And then they will often be expert in specific data types and technologies. So this could be specific types of sensors or renderers or modeling or other simulation technologies. The skills that we tend to run into uh, being needed by customers to actually build synthetic data applications include things like having sensor domain expertise. So for example, we're seeing more demand for things like hyperspectral imaging, synthetic aperture radar, and, and even just classic RGB imagery in the remote sensing domain. Uh, some folks will definitely need to have AI training uh, data wrangling skills. They'll need to be able to understand things like how to compare data sets and then how to even mix and match synthetic data sets with real data sets. All focused on a specific domain problem. Of course, uh, customers need familiarity with data science concepts and techniques. And then we see technical skills uh, that are required to build synthetic data, including things like Python programming, familiarity with 3D, and then a variety of other possible vertical domain uh, tools and toolkits such as, for example, a lot of demand we're seeing around the geospatial industry. Synthetic data generation tends to be an empirical process. We often work with customers to back them up from a place where they are today, where they're scraping together data and they're basically making do, and we have to ask them to more clearly identify the problem they're trying to address. From there, we often work with customers to help them describe the ideal data set that they think is needed for, uh, for training an AI or solving a problem. We then help them generate data using uh, the rendered platform, or they may even build out the synthetic data applications to generate data themselves using our platform. Then they see if they can achieve any training uh, accuracy at all. From there, they often refine data generation and then once they've achieved a certain level of training, that's kind of their minimum expectation, then they apply other techniques to see if they can, they can improve training even beyond where they got with their initial data generation. We, we find that the synthetic data generation process tends to have a variety of different distinct components. 
there are uh, there is one step where a customer may be required to characterize their the scenarios that they need in their synthetic data. This typically ends up being a requirement to uh, to understand what data types are being output, what kinds of variability are going to be required in the data sets, and then some focus on which specific problems are being addressed or tested. For example, remote sensing, you may be in some cases just trying to count objects. In other cases, you may be trying to count objects that are being obscured by cloud cover or by, by other uh, in-scene objects or assets. From there, customers often then need to pull together all the components that will make up the world that, that they're simulating. We also end up working with customers who need to describe the sensors that they're modeling and the actual uh, simulation effects that are required for to, to emulate the actual uh, operation of those sensors in the real world. Annotation and mass calculation can have specific requirements depending upon the types of data sets and problems that customers are trying to solve and need. Uh, we may uh, help customers employ things like domain adaptation for post-processing to make synthetic data sets appear more like real data sets. And then there is a phase of job execution and data set compilation. For a customer to basically do this on their own, they will be essentially building their own cloud infrastructure and content management systems to be able to run lots of jobs and then manage all the data sets. And then finally, um, Render provides and other, other vendors provide some capabilities to actually characterize and compare data sets. We typically talk about some distinct phases of effort during the synthetic data, uh, what we call channel development activity. A channel for us is a, a, a focused synthetic data application that is designed to output specific types of, of computer vision content plus annotation and other metadata that will be used to train AI around a certain domain. Uh, that could be a, a, a simulation uh, real world scenario domain or it could be specific sensor uh, modalities or domains. And so channel development typically is conducted by the synthetic data engineer that we talk about. Sometimes this may be a database engineer. And what they'll be doing is aggregating and creating some content, modeling digital sensors, and then creating the configurable channel that will then be deployed to the rendered platform where computer vision engineers and data scientists and even automated workflows can basically take those channels, uh, create and configure graphs that will drive the specific execution of, of jobs on the channels, run jobs, get data sets, and then take the data sets outside rendered and train and evaluate AI. Channels for us often become open source examples for customers to build upon. Our basic example channel that we have uh, is Blender based and it basically is a box of toys that operate as the objects of interest that are then combined with a simple RGB camera sensor and, uh, and some very basic con configuration about how the sensor and lighting work in that environment. And then a uh, user can use this to, to generate generate uh, images, data sets. From there, we also provide, outside the channel, we provide uh, CycleGAN microservices for domain adaptation. Uh, we provide custom annotation services and a variety of other things within, uh, within Rendered. Underneath it all, uh, Rendered provides job management, user management, enroll management, archive and search, and a variety of other capabilities in, in Rendered AI Cloud so that customers can basically focus on building and configuring the channels that they need for their data sets without having to worry about all of the management activity that goes on around running jobs in the cloud. Our typical example channel focuses on using Blender as a renderer. We also offer an ArcGIS channel that allows customers to retrieve 2D raster backgrounds for uh, simulated remote sensing information. We are working on an Omniverse channel so that we can use NVIDIA Omniverse and extensions. Uh, this will include a variety of pre-installed dependencies specifically for Omniverse, and, but otherwise will function uh, identically as, uh, as the Blender channels function. 
and in the future we'll be adding a variety of other channels focused on tools such as Deersig and even uh, even other renders and game engines that are out there in the community today. Ultimately, the point of providing a platform is so that our customers don't have to rebuild everything for every AI application. And what we are doing is building out this capability to capture sensors and sensor platforms for specific vertical applications in a modular architecture that can be deployed to the cloud and that includes content pipelines, sensor models, analytics tools, and integrations to popular AI toolkits such as SageMaker and to NVIDIA Tau. The ultimate goal of providing a platform is to reduce the total cost of ownership to our customers to enable them to access synthetic data as an enterprise capability. Along with the rendered platform, we focus on providing tools that enable uh, the complex workflow that it takes to make synthetic data generation successful. Typically, we break this up into channel building, data creation, post-processing, and then integrating into other pipelines. In this case, with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and Orbital Insight, we conducted a study where uh, we helped the customer search for cranes and crane trucks as economic indicators in satellite imagery. These objects are relatively rare compared to other features in overhead imagery, and labeling them can re be really difficult for humans. The Orbital Insight case study was able to demonstrate that we were able to increase the average precision of model training by combining real and synthetic data and it also demonstrated that overall we were able to reduce the total amount of data required to train AI. There are many, many examples of the application of rendered AI to real world customer problems. These range from uh, sensor fusion, uh, video applications combining IIR and RGB imagery to uh, developing synthetic data for urban environments Synthetic, uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar, uh, an x-ray simulator built on top of rendered by one of our, our, our partners, and many other cases. Thank you for your time. And now Katya is going to speak with us about training AI models with NVIDIA Tau Toolkit. Hello, I am Ekaterina, a data scientist from NVIDIA. And today, I'd like to give you an introduction of our Tau Toolkit. Many of you know NVIDIA as a GPU or hardware company, um, but that's not entirely true. Uh, I'd like to cite our CEO here, uh, Jensen Huang, who uh, likes to say that NVIDIA is not a GPU company, it's a platform company. And by saying that, uh, he means that uh, in addition to our hardware products, we also have many software products available. In our software products for AI, uh, we aim at uh, covering the whole uh, life cycle of uh, a deep learning model, starting from uh, data collection uh, and preparation to going through training, and then finally, um, also we have tools for deployment. So in this workshop, the first part is actually addressed by uh, the colleagues from Render AI, where they tell you how to create data using their synthetic data generation tools. And uh, in my part, I will tell you how to use our TAO toolkit in order to train a model using this synthetic data. First of all, let me uh, share with you what assets we have available to enable you with end-to-end -end AI model training. So first of all, uh, we have a collection of our pre-trained models. Um, these are pre-trained models for different use cases like uh, people detection, vehicle detection, license plate recognition, pose estimation, and phase detection. Um, and the, there are actually many, many more other use cases available. Um, These pre-trained models have been trained on uh, the data sets curated 
and co collected and curated by NVIDIA. And we store these models on uh, our NGC, uh, the so-called uh, NVIDIA GPU cloud, which is a, basically a software repository uh, where we have uh, Docker containers uh, optimized for our GPUs. Uh, with this uh, pre-trained models, uh, you can bring your own data and you can further adapt these models using the Tau Toolkit. The Tau Toolkit is a zero coding tool for training and it allows you either to train a model from scratch, uh, adapt an existing one as like the pre-trained models, and furthermore, it allows you also to optimize your model uh, in order to make it the most efficient for deployment. And then finally, after you have uh, uh, put your model through this uh, optimization uh, training step, uh, you have your own model, which you can use uh, for production. This is uh, free for even for commercial deployment. And uh, then we also help you with uh, the deployment tools, such as, uh, for example, the DeepStream SDK for video analytics. Uh, we also have a set of uh, sample turnkey apps, uh, which I'm not uh, covering in this uh, lecture today. Here I'm showing you how NGC catalog, the NVIDIA GPU Cloud catalog looks like. So on the main page, we uh, store different collections for different use cases. So we categorize our software in like, for example, is it a high performance computing software or is it a software for deep learning? So it's, e it's really easy to navigate and browse. Uh, and uh, depending on what you look for, uh, you can quickly find it also using the search option here. Here I'm showing you how the end-to-end -end AI development and deployment collection looks like. So you can see here a list of containers which are typically used by uh, deep learning researchers and uh, developers. And the, you can see here that we have uh, the containers for PyTorch and TensorFlow. These are our uh, versions optimized for our GPUs. Uh, we also have software for deployment like TensorT and Trident Inference Server. Um, we have uh, also speech uh, processing, speech recognition um, frameworks available. And finally, Tao is also in this collection. So if you want to try it, just uh, go to the NGC, uh, search for this end-to-end -end development and deployment collection and find Tao Toolkit there. And I also mentioned that our pre-trained models are also hosted on NGC. So uh, for that, you basically, the best way to find it is start from the Tau page and we have a list of these pre-trained models uh, available. So then if you click to each individual model, uh, you will see such a model uh, card. Uh, where we basically describe uh, what does this model do, uh, how has it been trained on which data set, which was the distribution of the data set. Um, we also mentioned what are the limitations of the model and uh, its performance on different hardware. So let me provide you with more details on what Tau actually is. So as you see here, uh, Tau Toolkit uh, supports uh, training for vision and for conversational uh, AI. And uh, underneath, it's basically a collection of uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which you can download from NGC, as I mentioned. And there you can just follow step by step uh, the whole process of training, starting from data preparation and augmentation, um, including, of course, uh, the training step. And uh, furthermore, you can also apply some optimization techniques like pruning and quantization. Um, it all works uh, on the uh, CUDA, our CUDA X stack, including video container runtime, CUDA and CUDNN. And it's also fully compatible uh, with our TensorT, the optimizing compiler. 
Uh, Tele Toolkit can run on any of our training platforms, be it uh, any workstation with an NVIDIA GPU, a DJX station, or in the cloud. And the models trained with Tau can be deployed on literally any NVIDIA GPU, also including our embedded Jetson family. Here's an example application I created using Tau Toolkit. Uh, so that's uh, me in my home office. And as you see here, uh, it's a gesture recognition application running. So uh, the way I created it, I uh, used uh, the pre-trained model for people detection and I retrain it with Tau uh, using some open source uh, hand detection data set. Uh, then using this hand detection model, I um, cascaded it with a model for gesture recognition, which I just downloaded from the NGC without any further training. And I deployed these two models uh, using DeepStream SDK. And this is all running on a Jetson device and uh, it has real time performance. So you see that the models are very efficient. In addition to pre-trained models, we also support a broad variety of state-of-the-art models, including image classification, object detection, and segmentation models. So uh, all these models have been pre-trained on open image data set, and uh, they are fine to use uh, even for commercial deployment from the legal perspective. I'd like to speak now about optimization techniques. And I know that in the research community, it's often all about accuracy. But when we're dealing with real business cases, uh, it's really very important also to have our models which are performing well, which have uh, high uh, throughput and low latency. And uh, in order to achieve that, uh, we have included uh, some optimization techniques in our Tau Toolkit. And the first one is a technique called quantization. Quantization is basically mapping uh, from floating point 32 precision to integer 8. Uh, you can also use floating point 16, but uh, as you may guess that uh, energy aid is more efficient. And uh, converting to floating point 16 is kind of easy. So you basically just round up the number and use it. Uh, however, with integer 8, if you just round up the number, you will lose a lot of precision. So in order not to lose uh, precision, um, you, can pr uh, you can basically estimate the so-called mapping from FP32 to int 8. And there are two ways to do this. Uh, the first one is called post-training quantization, uh, or also it's called calibration. Uh, for that, you need a separate data set on which you run your model and you estimate the minimum and maximum values uh, of the weights in the model and then use it to uh, basically to uh, find this mapping. Um, there is another way to do it uh, by using the so-called quantization aware training. And basically uh, by doing that, you're learning this mapping during the training. And uh, as you may guess, this is uh, kind of more efficient and precise. And uh, we enable this quantization aware training in Tau Toolkit. So in the exit, uh, you get your model and then the calibration file uh, available together with your model. Another optimization technique is called pruning. Pruning means removing net, uh, neurons which do not participate in the final prediction. Uh, the way you do it is you basically rank these neurons based on their influence uh, in the final score and then compare it, comparing them to some threshold, uh, you just remove those which are uh, not very active. Uh, by removing neurons, you also remove the associated connections, which uh, makes the network small in size and also leaner and faster in execution. Uh, the only downside of this process is that by, uh, when pruning the model, you may lose a little bit of accuracy. Uh, that's why you need a second training round to restore the accuracy after pruning. 
Automated Mixed Precision is a technique uh, which is designed to make your training faster. Uh, it is also associated with quantization and uh, it is available in a uh, couple of uh, latest uh, generations of GPU uh, due to the presence of our Tensor cores. So the way it works that uh, before the training, so you have your data in floating point 32, but once you once the, the data gets through the model, it is converted to floating point, uh, floating point 16. Uh, when it reached the optimization step, uh, the, uh, the data gets converted back to floating point 32 to keep the precision uh, on its maximum. And then uh, for the back propagation, it's, uh, it's converted to floating point 16 again. Uh, doing this allows to accelerate AI training. Uh, it helps you also to reduce the memory bandwidth, meaning that you can also train larger models uh, or larger batches in uh, faster time. And uh, this feature is also available in Tao. So, and uh, actually enabling it is really super easy. You just add a parameter, an extra parameter to the training command. Tau Toolkit also supports multi-GPU training. In fact, it makes multi-GPU training uh, very easy. So the only thing you need to do here is to specify uh, how many GPUs you want to use. Um, in addition, you can also specify uh, which uh, specific GPUs you want to use for this training and Tau Toolkit will take care of the rest automatically. As I already mentioned, uh, Tau also supports data augmentation and we include different kinds of augmentation, including blur augmentation, uh, spatial transformations like uh, rotation, uh, zooming in, zooming out, cropping and padding. And we also have some color transformations. Um, you can easily control it by specifying, for example, the degrees of rotation or uh, the thresholds for color transformations. So you have the full control on augmentation parameters. As I also already mentioned, uh, Tau Toolkit uh, models are uh, fully compatible with NVIDIA TensorT. TensorT is our optimizing compiler and the runtime. And uh, underneath it includes a set of uh, optimization techniques like layer and tensor fusion, weight and activation uh, precision calibration, kernel auto-tuning, dynamic tensor memory, and multi-stream execution. And of course, Tau can be used to train with synthetic data. And uh, this will be the uh, following part of this workshop. The colleagues from Rendered AI will show you how to use Tau uh, to train a model using synthetic data. And last but not least, uh, please let me share with you some uh, NVIDIA resources. So first of all, here's the link to Tau Toolkit, where we have uh, everything from documentation to the link to the quick start guide and instructions. Uh, we have our NVIDIA technical blog where we regularly publish uh, some insights about hardware, uh, software, uh, and business aspects. Uh, we also have our NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute where you can learn uh, different aspects of deep learning. Um, also, the NGC Software Hub link is there um, where you can download all the software which I mentioned today for free. And finally, if you want to stay with us, uh, feel free to register for the NVIDIA Developer Program and the QR code on this uh, slide also leads you to the program registration link. With that, I'd like to wish you happy training and I hope you enjoy the workshop by Rendered AI. Hello, my name is Matt Robinson. I am a senior software engineer at Rendered AI. And today I will walk you through training an object tech detection model using synthetic data. So Chris has introduced uh, Rendered AI at large and Katya has given an overview of the Tau Toolkit and I will show how these two can be put together to close the loop on ML. OK, 
Okay, so um, the talk is broken up into five parts. I will describe the experiment and then show some target samples that we're going to try to um, recognize Rubik's cubes in, and then go to the uh, rendered AI dashboard and make sure that the graph is set up to generate data sets that we think will um, train the model to, to recognize the objects, and then use um, a, a, no a Jupyter notebook that is hosted on NGC to uh, to train the to train the model on the data in um, in a in the web browser and uh, finally visualize the inferences to see how it worked. So um, the details of the experiment are as follows. Um, we're going to train an object detection model using uh, an open source notebook and the um, one of the steps will be to process the annotations and metadata that come from the synthetic data, data set to, in, into a kitty label format and then um, a, into TensorFlow record format to be used with the DetectNet v2 model. The, um, the, uh, the backbone object detection model um, comes from the NGC catalog where there are several models to choose from and we'll take a look at those. And then um, train the model and uh, inference the target images to see how uh, how the accuracy looks to see how, how well um, the, the data set um, <clears throat> matches. Okay, so here they are. Um, I just went and put Rubik's cubes in various locations in the house. Um, some of them are little toy Rubik's cubes hidden uh, amongst objects. Some of them are um, sitting uh, in various scenarios with different camera angles. And uh, and then over on, on the right hand side here, you can see a couple of these images actually are synthetic image data images as well, just to, just to throw some variety in and see um, if we can recognize objects in different contexts. And I think the, the synthetic data graph is built to try to match these as best it can. So um, let's go and take a look at the uh, the graph that is that we'll use. Um, when you sign up with uh, Rendered AI, um, there's a an opportunity to enter your content code, and uh, with the CVPR 2022 content code, the um, your account will be um, built off of this this workspace. Um, so there's a whole concept of workspaces inside the uh, rendered AI platform and you are highly encouraged to go look at the support doc to to learn more about all the features that the platform provides. Um, but uh, the point right now is that when you sign up with the CBPR 2022 content code, this particular data uh, workspace is cloned into your account, so it's yours to, to work with um, and already has some, some pre-built graphs. So this um, CVPR 2022, sorry, the, CV, the, the uh, Rubik's Cube graphs here, graph here is one that I put together um, to kind of target or to, uh, to make a data set that I thought would um, um, train a model to recognize the target images, to recognize the objects in the target images. Um, so the, the graph um, ultimately ends in the render node, which generates the images. Um, the, uh, um, the, basically, the, so the scene is, um, is, is created in the nodes prior, uh, in which the objects are, are dropped into a container, and the container's on a floor. So you choose various kinds of things you want in the background. And um, in terms of the placement of uh, uh, you know the objects that are chosen, uh, the number of objects is a random number between eight and fifteen, and the uh, the type of object that's chosen comes from um, one of these three branches, and uh, this branch is weighted uh, four times heavier than the other ones, 
So effectively, a third of the objects that come in or that are uh, or that are selected are Rubik's cubes, and the other two thirds are just random objects with different colors to kind of make a bunch of variety, as much as variety as I could kind of squeeze in with this really basic example channel. Um, <clears throat> so if you come over to the data sets library, um, you'll see that there's already two data sets that have been built. And the, uh, the, this Rubik's Cubes one um, has, uh, has 400 images in it. This, the, that comes from the graph that we were just looking at. So you can take a look to see, make sure that they kind of look like what you expect. And then um, we can, uh, so, it, so this uh, has, shows also the, the details of the data sets. Um, and um, these, these IDs can be used by the SDK. And uh, let's go take a look at how that works. So um, now that we're happy with the graph, that we think it looks like it's probably going to uh, lead to a, a data set that, that trains our model. Um, uh, the, I've um, put together this um, resource on the NGC catalog called uh, Tau with Synthetic Data Fast Demo. So if you sign up with NGC, uh, you, sorry, create an NVIDIA account, then um, in the NGC catalog online, um, you can just do a search for synthetic data and find this right at the top. Um, the uh, NGC uh, developers have integrated uh, this deploy with Vertex AI option in the top right. So you can just immediately um, run the notebook on a Google Cloud Platform in their Vertex AI product. <clears throat> so um, sparing the details of setting up an NGC account, or sorry, a, a GCP account, um, I will just uh, jump over to uh, what you will see once you follow that link. And um, this is the, uh, the workbench in Vertex AI view. So this is where you manage the notebooks, notebooks, the, uh, and the and by manage notebooks it means to um, uh, change the GPUs that they're going to be deployed on, or any data extra disk space that might be needed. Um, kind of your typical cloud choices for for managed services. Um, the uh, so um, once the you have your notebook here and. Um, it's it's uh it's started. Then you can open it in Jupyter Lab, and uh, what that means is that you get your Jupyter Lab dashboard with uh, the files that are uh, hosted there on the NGC resource. And um, it, one of the steps that takes a few minutes here will be to load the custom kernel uh, that's part of the integration. And so the entire Python environment uh, comes with the package, and we're ready to roll now with uh, with all the dependencies in place. <clears throat> so uh, getting into the notebook, we have it's uh, this kind of intro section that uh, is here for for you to read over um, when you come to run this yourself. The um, the schematic here indicate it shows how you know what we mean by closed loop ML with synthetic data, where uh, it's it's all dri it's all driven by the graph of the rendered AI system. So uh, you configure a graph to create the data set, and then um, part of our APIs involve uh, a metrics, uh, sorry, an analytics uh, metrics. So we can take a look at the uh, the number of objects per image and the size of the bounding boxes, or the color uh, and brightness. So very whatever metrics we think are going to be important to the uh, object detection model. And then um, <clears throat> once those adjustments are taken into consideration, um, we can go ahead and train and evaluate with Tau, and see if the 
model is in fact uh, uh, has the accuracy we're looking for or the speed. So um, and this performance can then additionally inform whether or not we need to update the graph and uh, get the best uh, data set um, for, for, the, for our purposes. So um, the first step is to import ANA tools. Um, it, that is not built into the kernel and needs to be added afterwards, but I've already been here, so ANA tools installed. So that's our SDK from rendered AI. Um, so um, once, our, uh, once we have all of our dependencies in place, um, we set up the environment variables for the for the project, which just kind of says where the data sets are and the uh, the specs file, which is um, this directory here that has all of our um, the different configuration files needed for for the Tau toolkit. Um, let's see. So with that in place, um, we can we um, we build this thing called the uh, um, mounts file. So the mounts file um, is this is this tau mounts uh, file that is written to your uh, home directory to uh, help the um, it's it's to support the the Docker container of tau so that the local files are mounted to the right location in the in the Docker for for tau. This uh, notebook has is a uh, based. I need to say at the very beginning here, it's based on the uh, the, the Tau DetectNet notebook that is um, in the NGC catalog. So um, this is kind of the the baseline uh, notebook that uh, that Nvidia built to highlight the the strengths of of the DetectNet V2 model. And um, so that's where I got these uh, the the mounts details here. So it's, it's nothing too fancy, <clears throat> but um, it's important to, to know that there is another notebook out there. Um, th yeah, for, for DetectNet v2. Let's see, so <clears throat> so, this, so in terms of the training data, um, I will log in to, uh, to rendered AI with my, uh, my alias here. And um, I went. I used the SDK after the login to uh, to get the data sets, and then to kind of create them or to to list them with uh, some structure. So um, it lists them by name, the description, and then the status. Uh, so the uh, the description of um, this bottom one here, CVPR Rubik's cubes, has 400 images with 400 by 400 resolution. And so now I can um, so. Uh, now this the ID is associated with this with the name um, in uh, in this uh, in this structure in this dictionary that I created and can just I can just refer now to the data set by name. Um, just a little hand holding. The point is is that we have the the data set ID ready to go. And um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is uh, create uh, a a directory name uh, based on the data set name, which is CVPR Rubik's Cubes, and then download the data set. <clears throat> so because we're on Google and it's really fast, we already have it here. Oh no, never mind, it's not, we're not there yet. So here's the, uh, the data set metadata. So more details that are provided from, from the SDK, using the SDK to access the data set. And then, um, Downloading. 
complete and unzip it and uh, and then print the uh, the contents of the directory. So you see we have the metadata and the images and the masks and everything that comes along for the ride with the uh, data set. So um, the, the first step is to convert the annotations to kitty labels. Uh, the annotations are general. Um, they're robust and are prepared to support various annotation formats. Um, we have built out um, conversions for kitty labels, for Cocoa labels, Pascal, and uh, a couple of the SageMaker um, annotation formats. So now, um, with the uh, with for DetectNet v2, we need to have kitty format, kitty label formats. So, um, so here's just a helper function that'll generate kitty labels. Um, but what's important is to get the mappings files. So the mappings file is out there in uh, in the rendered AI GitHub uh, um, resource <clears throat> on GitHub. The mappings file there's few there's a few mappings files there. <clears throat> this one Rubik Cube uh, is built to make all objects distractors other than the Rubik's Cube, so that um, the object detection model only trains on Rubik's Cubes. The, um, the default mappings file just tr treats every toy as its own class, so it's built to detect bubble bottles and um, Play-Doh tubs and whatever the toys are um, individually. And there's another um, example out there for a mappings file that's just called toys, in which all of the objects are just mapped to the toys class. So whatever, just to kind of give some examples of, of how you would um, convert a synthetic data annotation to um, a, a project-specific annotation format. So we're going to go to Kitty. We're going to use the Rubik's Cube mapping. And then um, convert. Do the, you, you use, um, yeah, so go ahead and do the conversion and then uh, take a look at them. So here you can see in this particular image, number 97, uh, there was one distractor and one Rubik's Cube, and there's what the kitty label data looks like. So it looks, looks all good. Um, moving on to now converting the kitty labels into uh, TensorFlow records for use with Tau. Um, so uh, let's see here. This, um, when, one of the things I do throughout the notebook is to take these uh, um, specification files, the configuration files for Tau, and um, I, I convert them over to a, to, to a temp um, and uh, change the, the variable names in there. So they're written with like dataset dir as a variable, or I'm treating dataset dir as a variable and then replacing it with a real dataset directory. So, um, so you can see here that now the, um, the kitty conversion configuration file now has this kind of elaborate long name of where the data set is listed. And so and now that we can verify that the conversion script is accurate and go ahead and run the data set convert command from, from tau to technet v2. And then verify that the TensorFlow records showed up. So all looks good. So um, step three to prepare the model. So um, we need to go get the backbone from uh, from NGC. And this uh, first um, cell uh, downloads the command line interface for NGC. And then we can uh, call it and um, take a look at the options. So this lists all of the pre-trained TechNet v2 models. So there's various versions here. Um, we're interested in this ResNet 18 one, but there's um, all kinds of, um, of TechNet 2 versions available. So um, this, let's see here. So now we're, uh, so what I went, okay, so here we are downloading the uh, v ResNet 18. And um, it, it's so now all the weights are here locally for us to use, for uh, for the notebook to access. And um, 
it's time to prepare the training specification. So um, again, you're going to convert the spec file to a temp file and replace all the data set dir and project dir to <clears throat> the real ones that we have in this example. And then I went ahead and listed the entire file so we can see all the hyperparameters that are being used for the training campaign. Um, oh, I, uh, I, I preserved the resolution of the training images, so they're all they're both 400 by 400. Uh, I didn't want to change any of that. Um, the number of epochs is set to to 60, and uh, lots of others. But those are, I think are the only two I changed from the from the default settings. Um, I didn't want to get too much into the weeds on the uh, hyperparameters. I just wanted to make a training set that would work pretty well and so I just trusted the NVIDIA engineers to have their default values. So um, so now it's time so now that the uh, configuration file is there and the record and the, t the data set has been converted to TF records or at least the annotations the annotations the annotations are converted to TF records the images are there and so the training can take place. So this takes about 10 minutes. Um, so I went ahead and just did it in another account so we can skip to the future by me just changing tabs. And uh, when the tra training is done, um, here at the very end it says that the on the validation set, the Rubik's Cube class is has an average precision of 94.6%. So um, it, pretty, it looks pretty good. Um, so uh, probably worthwhile now to to look a little bit deeper and take a, and visualize the uh, the inferences. <clears throat> so let's see. So let's um, it's the same process as for training. Um, um, I, I download the the images from uh, a, a public URL. And um, then update the the inference specification file with the lo with the correct uh, directory. And here's the parameters for your uh, inference. <coughs> We're going to um, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. And then the the confidence threshold is set at ninety percent. And then. Um, run the inferences and take a look at the results. So what um, the, the, the point of the exercise is to um, find out if there's any uh, false positives or false negatives that are jumping out and then update the graph accordingly. Um, an anecdote here is that uh, when I first set this up, I showed Katya the results and it was missing cubes that were at an angle. So um, she immediately recognized that um, in the, 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 the channel, the synthetic data channel needed to be updated to, um, to not be so directly overhead and that the angle, the camera needed to come down a little bit. And then when I made that adjustment, sure enough, we recognized nearly all of the Rubik's cubes with, with few false positives. Um, I'm not quite sure why this, this one up here in the strawberry patch doesn't, doesn't get found. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think it's it's a pretty good start. Um, uh, probably more accuracy would come if the images were larger and and there was more of them. But uh, I just wanted to get uh, just a small data set to to demonstrate the, the functionality. But um, if so, that's that's some hypotheses. I'm not sure if um, yeah. The idea is for a computer vision scientist to to look through these um, and maybe maybe get an evaluation set and a metric to say I, I would need to update the channel to to prevent a particular thing or to capture a particular thing and uh, and then that's what we do at rendered is just iterate with our customers to uh, get these um, the training data up to spec so thank you and um, please reach out with any questions Hey, I'm Sam, and I'll be talking about how you develop a synthetic data channel on the rendered AI platform. So to go over what I'll be speaking about, 
First, we'll recap this, what the synthetic data channel is. Then we'll talk about the simulation engines and how the rendered AI architecture supports them. We'll talk about digital twin sensors. And next, I'll go over uh, the code base for the example channel, the different nodes that it has, and talk about how it uses the RGB sensor. Um, I'll have a live demo of adding a new Blender model to the example channel. Um, and next, I'll talk about how you deploy a new channel to the rendered AI platform so you can use that almost immediately to generate data sets. And finally, we'll talk about the rendered AI SDK. So to recap what a synthetic data channel is, um, the synthetic data channel is a container for the simulation engine, sensors, object and background models and application specific code to define the physics for the rendering of the synthetic data. So we believe that data generation is a science and it's a cyclical process. So we, we believe that it has these three steps. First, the synthetic data engineer will build a channel. So they'll develop the nodes. Next, with this channel, um, the computer vision scientists will use that to build the graphs and generate the data sets. And finally, based off of these data sets, they'll evaluate the results. So they'll look at what's in the data sets and maybe they'll, you know, realize something is missing because they know what the data requirements are. So what they would do is ask for more data or more uh, different nodes from the synthetic data engineer so that um, they'll get what they need out of the data sets. So maybe they'll find like a missing background or a missing model, or maybe they want to go in and update the physics. So it's it's all possible through our platform. So because of this, we believe that synthetic data needs to have a platform and can't be commissioned work. And we provide the tools and documentation so you can build the data yourself. One real world example of this is um, in the prior experiment that Matt had spoken about, um, he was not getting the results that he needed from his experiment. So all he did was he went in and modified the camera angle um, for the data set, and then he generated data sets, and then he found that the new data sets worked a lot better for him. So it, it is a very quick process, um, and, and you could have complete control over it. So now let's talk about the simulation engines and the engines that we support. We support Blender, Omniverse, and Deersig currently, and there will be more rendering engines to come. So all three of these engines are ray tracing and physics based. Blender is a simple RGB um, <clears throat> engine that is useful for common camera synthetic images. Deersig is a render adapted to platform for other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and useful for atmospheric science. Omniverse is useful for robotics and warehouses. So channels are wrappers around these simulation software packages. So on the right here, you see the diagram of, of what a channel is and the question mark, that's kind of where the simulation engine would plug in. Then you would use, you you define your physics and object properties in the custom code that's written in Python. And all of this will get packaged up with Docker and it will get containerized and deployed to the platform. And this is what works and, and this is what will run in the cloud. So simulation engineers will work with the computer vision scientists and industry experts to get the channels built up. And within these uh, channels, there are simulated hardware platforms that will provide motion and attachment for multiple sensors and sensor types. So maybe a camera or a spectrometer could be mounted to a platform and it could have motion or it could also be without motion. So some examples of motion are drone motion, stereo, where you have like a left and a right camera or walking, and you can change the viewing angles for the cameras. So if you want like an aerial image, you would, you know, have the camera from the top looking down and you can have like a low shot where you want the camera close to the ground looking up for stereo. If you want like a left and a right camera, you could have two cameras defined, maybe a certain distance apart and you would essentially get two different images for walking. Maybe you'd want like few cameras set up 
in you know a certain um, uh, length with a uh, step angle of or, or step size of, of like maybe 10 meters so whatever you need and whatever cameras you need you can define them within the channels so a camera is one example of a sensor uh, it's an rgb sensor but we support more than that we have support for black and white we have a custom synthetic aperture radar or SAR simulator, and we have hyperspectral, multispectral, and infrared support. So on the right here, it's a similar diagram as before. We've chosen Blender here as a simulation engine, and within Blender, here's some examples of the sensor platforms and the way that um, the camera or sensor mounted to it would behave. So for satellite imagery, that's what's used for SAR. Um, for like the camera, you could have a tripod or have it mounted to a drone. The drone is what's used for deer sitting. And here are two great examples of synthetic data that was generated on our platform. So on the left, um, we have generated a SAR image of a Star Destroyer from Star Wars. So this is not a real ship. This was never a real ship. Um, it was generated through the model of the Star Destroyer run with our SAR simulator. And on the right is an image generated with Deer SIG um, with a push broom sensor for Earth observation. Um, and this image is of dirt roads and grasslands. So what we found is data sets need annotations and synthetic data provides the automated creation of pixel perfect data labeling. So we provide every single data set with annotations. So you can use these annotation files and convert them to the different formats that you need and essentially know exactly where any object is within every single image. So now let's talk about the example channel. The example channel uses the Blender simulation engine and a RGB camera sensor to generate data. So it's a very simple channel. There are certain objects that will be dropped from the top into containers and or they can be dropped onto the floor and it has objects, containers, floor backgrounds um, and different modifiers. So the physics for the channel is simply that you're dropping objects and the render node is the RGB sensor. So Let's go over the code base for this channel. So I'm going to jump on over to our GitHub page, and you can jump on over also to follow along. So the interpreter will basically take this code and run it in the container on our cloud. Um, but let's say that you want to do local development. So I'll kind of go through it in a way that you can um, essentially use this example channel as a template and you could clone it and create your own channel with this. So at the top level, and reminder again, this code base is github.com slash render dash AI slash example. So at the top level, we have our channel definition file and the name of this file is you'll have your channel name first and it's a dot YAML. So if we click on it, we'll go through some of the important pieces in here. So because we're using Blender as a simulation engine, for type, you define it as Blender. We have a few nodes that we are, we are selecting from our Anna tools, Python SDK that we have available on PyPI. We are reusing the weight and the random ran int, which is the random integer nodes from that package. So we don't have to write it ourselves. And those are kind of the key pieces. So um, if you're familiar with Python packages, the actual code for the channel is essentially equivalent to what you would see for a Python package. So the code for the channel itself is under packages slash example. Setup.py, this is what you've, you've been familiar with before. You can define your versioning and your like authors. Um, and like your licensing information in here. So if we go into example, at the high level, package.yaml, this is a very important file. So this is essentially your uh, 
way of defining how you're taking in the Blender files and like where they're, the objects are located in the blend file. So you could have multiple objects defined in a single file. So for example, let's talk about how there's like six or several different containers here and they're all using the exact same file. So um, if we open up the containers file itself, all right, so here um, you can see at the high level, the object names are exactly matching like with the case and spacing to your object names here. So um, light wooden box is here, light wooden box, we have dark wooden box, and so on. So uh, we have some steps that you would have to take to create these Blender files yourself. Um, you'd have to define like your parent hierarchy here. So if you wanna know more about how to do that, go to support.render.ai. We have some great development guides there. And I'll also kind of be walking through a little bit more with um, a demo of the blend file that I used. Another important piece here is the volume section. So volumes are basically the S3 buckets that we're using to store these individual blend files and we group them together with like IDs. So um, this is the ID that we're using for the example channel. Now, if you're gonna run this locally, you would basically have a folder created with this exact ID and um, have all the blend files located there so that you can run the rendering locally. So now let's let's go back and talk about some of the different nodes that we have. So you can see here that each Python file has a matching YAML file to go along with it. So um, if we go through the color variation modifier and click through the YAML file, so what this YAML file is, is it's basically the schema for your uh, graph node. So if you go into the Rendered AI UI. Let me pull that up here. And if you go into the graph editor, so if you use uh, the CVPR 2022 content code, you can follow along and have these graphs available to you. So I'm going to open up the CVPR Rubik's Cubes graph and I'm going to open up. the color variation modifier node. So here's what the color variation node looks like. And what you can see is you can define some of these like parameters um, as defaults. So all of these parameters show up in your dropdown. You can define what the different inputs are. So here we have input as like the actual color itself, which is these parameters from the dropdown. And the other inputs is, it has to be a type of generator to be an input link. And you can also define what the output link is here. So output is generator. Um, and then you can define how you want it to show up in the list. So we're having it show up in the modifiers list under the color header and the name of the actual node is called color variation. You would define a YAML file for every single node that you're developing so that you can have control over how it shows up in the UI. And you can even define a like tooltip like helper to um, kind of give some info on what it is. So for example, if you hover over the eye, you can see that it matches over to the tooltip value on the left. I'll talk a little bit about the dropobjects.py at a high level. Um, if you wanna know exactly what the code is and what it does, I would highly suggest for you to just look through it on your own. So um, there's different ways to go about placement. So maybe you wanna randomly drop um, something like what we're doing, or maybe you wanna throw something into the air. Maybe you have certain areas in like a scene or like your background where you'd want objects to generate within. So you want it to be like a bounded. So for example, if you want objects to fill in a parking lot just in like a few different locations, but you want to have like trees on one side, um, you can you can define you can define that. We're using the Blender API to do that. And um, 
Another example is maybe you want to randomize colors and textures. So we're randomizing colors with color variation, but if you want to get more granular with it, you can go further. You can reuse the drop objects physics know that we have, or you could write one yourself. So that's a little bit about the nodes. Um, I kind of want to leave it at a high level because we have a lot of great support talk on our support site that you can read through if you want to dig in more. So now I'm going to go back up to the root level here and talk about the different mappings, mapping files that the example channel has and what a mapping file is. So we have three different mapping files here. So the files are interfaces with the machine learning engines and using these files, you can highlight points of interest. So this will help with setting up the annotation files. And with this, you can be as granular or generic as you want with your annotation. And this will essentially label every object as you would like it to. So if we look through the default mapping file, you can see here that um, there's classes and properties, and for each class, there's a number assigned to it from 0 to 6, and then 99 is a distractor. So basically, distractors are going to get ignored, and here, every single object is assigned to a number, so you want all of these objects essentially to show up in the image, or sorry, annotated file. And here, um, one, one thing I'll, I'll point out is Rubik's cubes, we have sorted and unsorted Rubik's cubes. So like, you know, when you mix them up versus when you solve the cube. So that's why we have two different types of cubes here, but they're all part of the same class called Rubik's cube. So this is a little bit different than, for example, if you wanted to just highlight all the Rubik's cubes in an image. So here um, you would label Rubik's cube as zero and everything else is a distractor. So every other object is set to 99 versus the cube objects that we have are set to zero. So all the other objects are going to get ignored for the data labeling and only the cubes will get labeled. So um, this is kind of useful for the post-processing step of the data set. So essentially, once you run a job and you have a data set generated, so if, I, if, if you're following along here in the content code, if you click on like the CBPR Rubik's Cubes, you'll see a bunch of options here on the right. So here we ran it 400 times. So there's 400 images in the data set. What you can do is you can create the annotations with the um, different formats that we have supported here um, with these mapping files. So these are the mapping files that we just went over. And Dan will be covering this in a little bit more detail. Next, I wanted to show you how you'd actually go about cloning this repo and adding a Blender object to a channel. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a live demo. So let's say that you found a or you have a object file that you really want to add to a channel and what would you do to do this so what for for my example what i did was i went to turbo squid and i found like a super simple low poly image of like a mustang and unfortunately this is not available on turbo squid anymore they they seem to have taken it down but i was able to snag it before they did that <clears throat> So I had to change a few different things for this blend object. So I have it opened up here. So what I went and did was I resized this because when I first downloaded it, this was a very large uh, scaled car. It was like 40 feet long. And the example channel is, is you know, real size. Like it's, it's, it's scaling is like real life. So you'd want to scale everything down to around two inches. So when you drop them into a container, everything is kind of going to be the same size. And it won't drop like, you know, on top of the container. So um, next, what you'd want to do is go into the blend object itself and set up the hierarchy. So you're, you rename whatever the top level is here. So I have this name to car. <clears throat> Then you'd want to remove any existing cameras and light sources because we already have a camera defined with the RGB node. So any other 
cameras would just be extraneous and could mess with um, the final rendering. And then finally, you'd want to enable rigid body physics. So you could go into here, click on this option here, and um, toggle it on. And for settings, you'd want to have it enabled and then do disable collisions and then have it set to dynamic. All right, so now what I did was I created my object file and got it ready for use in local development of the channel. And then I went and cloned the channel and I was working off of the clone. So this is my cloned workspace here on the left. And you can see that this is essentially the same as what I went over. Um, there's a few extra things here. So we have a data directory, which is the all the blend files that I went and downloaded for this volume. And um, this is mapping to that package.yaml file that we spoke about before. We have our graphs directory, which I'll talk about because we'll be using this default graph to run the local development and the local rendering. We have our mappings folder again. We have our packages folder. So what I did here was I went and renamed the existing example.yaml to the name of the channel that I chose. So I chose the name example with toy car. So I renamed it to that. And I also renamed the example package to that name. So it was just like a simple refactor of the name. Next, what I did was I went into object generators.py and I added a new node for the car. So I essentially just copied an existing one. I copied a bubbles node went and modified a few other things with how the uh, get blend file generator is, is getting this name. And then I added the car node to my YAML file for this object generator. So we have a new car node here. And I did the same thing here. I just copied this bubble nodes and then just changed some of the names here. So for outputs, it's going to be outputting a car generator. The tooltip is going to show that it's a car factory. And as for the header, it's going to show up as car. Then finally, I went into the package.yaml and I pointed the, the car node to point to the file name for car.blend. And I uploaded this car.blend file up into here, into the volume. And finally, now we can kind of play around with the graph. So the default.yaml is the default graph that comes with the example channel. You can use this for a local development. So what I went and did was just to run it um, and test that the car you know, showed up correctly. I went and removed all the other nodes. I removed all the toys. And I kept the object placement generator and um, just kept the car in there. So we're going to have basically in graphical format, we would have a car that plugged into the object placement that will you know, be used and the object will get dropped into a container, which here we, we're going to keep the light wooden box that we already have from before. And this container is going to be on the floor that is type granite. And all of these will be running the uh, drop objects physics. And then for render, I changed the size of the image to 512 by 512 just because I wanted it to be really quick. And then the final change I'm going to make is for number of objects, I'm going to change this to just one because um, you know it takes time for the rendering to run. So if you're just doing local development, you want it to be pretty quick. So to run the render, you just type ANA, Anna, and it'll start. And what it'll do is create this output directory. Um, this will get auto-generated within it, and you'll have a few different um, directories here. So um, annotations is going to be your annotation files that get generated with our render rendered AI formatting that you can use to convert to other annotations like we spoke about. Images is going to be the actual image that's generated um, out of this render. Mask is going to be your image masks. 
metadata is any other like I guess metadata that you'd want to know about the image such as like when it was created or like what are the objects in it. So looks like our image is ready and great. So we have one car in it. Cool. So it looks like our new object got added into the channel successfully. So now let's modify this default.yaml a little bit more. Let's bring back all the other stuff. So I'm going to control Z everything back in because I want to check how all the other objects are going to behave. So we're going to go back to having all the other objects in it and we're going to have 15 objects again. And I'm going to run Anna again. And while this is running, this will take a little bit longer because now we have 15 objects. I'll kind of show you a few different um, phases of development that I had here. So for example, I had issues where the car was way too big and it was kind of falling on top of the container because this is all true to scale. Then um, I got the car a little bit smaller, but it was still too big. And you know, all the other objects would have been like really small next to it. So then I had to play around with the scale a bit more. Um, one example I wanted to show you is sometimes the uh, you can have an issue with with um, images that have like an overlap between like the container, and this will happen if you make the image or sorry the object model too small in scale. So Blender has issues with objects that are a little too small. I think under two inches because the physics does not behave as expected there. So just something to keep in mind if it's something you run into, try scaling your model up a little bit and that might solve your problem. So we're just waiting for this to finish and looks like it's done. So now let's open up this new image file. Cool, so it looks like all the other objects that we've had existing on our example channel show up here with the new car. Cool, so now what you'd wanna do is um, basically, you'd want to deploy this channel to our rendered AI platform because this channel is now ready to be used to generate data sets in the cloud. So um, in addition to deploying this, you'd also want to upload this volume to your to our platform. And for the volume upload, I would suggest to look at the SDK docs to understand how to do that. It's just one um, command that you have to run. And for the deployment, I have some examples here. For deployment, you basically run the Anna deploy command. You just type that into your command line terminal, and then it'll ask you, do you want to create a new channel or do you want to deploy it to an existing channel? So here I chose that I wanted to deploy it to an existing channel because I'd already created this channel. And then um, it'll take a few minutes to run. It'll have some output like this where it'll show you like the steps that it's running. And then once it's done, you can go to the workspace um, on the platform and enable it. So if you go into workspace here, click on the channels, then you'll be able to create a, a new graph with it. And so if you go into these graphs, I created this graph with this example toy car channel that I just showed you. And what you can see is we now have the car node in the object section here. And I've also added it into the graph itself. So it's going to render with the random placement um, node. And for data sets, if you want to explore what this looks like after you run the job with it, here's some examples of the images that have come out of this channel. Every single image is different. Everything's randomized. And everything also comes annotated. I'll wrap up by talking about our SDK. It's on PyPI and it's called Anna Tools. We use the SDK to deploy channels and manage volumes, but we can do everything that the UI does and more. It's useful for running batch scripts and running jobs and data sets headlessly. SDK.render.ai. We have links for some Jupyter notebooks that we find to be very helpful to learn how to use the SDK. And also the documentation is available at that link. This is what the documentation looks like. We have um, 
every function documented just like any other Python package that's out there. You click on this link, you can go and browse our resources repo, which holds a bunch of Jupyter notebooks that help to understand how to use the SDK, but also how you can use the SDK with machine learning pipelines. So some great notebooks I would like to highlight here are generating annotations for data sets, um, because as, as I said before, you can run annotations through the UI that run on the cloud, but we have draw type of annotations, which can only be run through the SDK. If you'd like to annotate your data sets with 2D or 3D bounding boxes or with segmentation, this is the way that you'd have to do it. Another great notebook is the data set analytics notebook. So you can um, run analytics jobs to get certain types of information about your data and metrics for statisticians. And this will help you understand if the data that you've generated is useful. And I'll hand it off to Dan now, who will speak more on the post-processing. Thanks, Sam. So Matt and Sam talked to you about how to generate synthetic data on the rendered AI platform. But I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about how to extend your synthetic data workflows and to uh, use adaptation and analysis to enhance the performance of your synthetic data once it's generated. So a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about annotation in within synthetic data. Uh, Sam talked briefly about that, but I'll, I'll touch, touch back to it. I'll also talk about how we can use some different uh, tools to close the reality gap or the domain gap within uh, synthetic data and real data. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, quality assessment and how we can use certain tools to better get a sense of the, the actual quality and uh, comparison uh, of our real data and our synthetic data. Uh, and then I'll go into a quick demo to, uh, about how to apply UMAP to an output data set and uh, compare that data set with the domain adapted data set uh, and how that compares with the real the real data that you might be training a model to detect. So one of the major benefits of using the synthetic data is that um, annotation is automatic. It, you don't need to pay a group of people to uh, humans to actually go into and label your own your own data. More so, it's it's 100% accurate, so you're not going to have to uh, deal with some of the quality uh, quality issues that come with human labeled data, and that becomes more important when you're working with very complex uh, sensor types and things that maybe not are not recognizable uh, to a human labeler. But beyond that, those are kind of the, the obvious benefits of, of using synthetic data. But beyond that, it's it's really configurable and ex extensible to so, such that you can really experiment with the types of annotations that are going to bring the most value to your data. And uh, you can really uh, kind of update those, those annotations in real time uh, to be able to perform that, that those types of uh, experiments. So Sam talked a little bit about the mapping file and, and how you can use that to control how the objects that you have in your scene are labeled uh, within your synthetic data sets. Um, and so uh, what Rendered AI provides is a standard data format that includes basically everything you would need to uh, understand your data and uh, label it in, in the way that you need. So. Uh, that includes things like 2D and 3D bounding box coordinates, uh, pixel-based mask information, so what exact pixels are represented by each of these different instances and uh, different um, types and classes of, of objects. Things like distance from the sensor uh, to get a sense of depth for, uh, for each of these different objects in your scene, their rotation and things like that. Uh, as well as uh, potentially the obstruction level, how much is it is it obstructed by other objects in your scene, and that's a that's an optional 
optional calculation that you can provide in there to inform things like kitty labels. And then once you have all this information, you can, uh, as a post-processing step, uh, generate new annotations for the data that you've already generated in different annotation formats like COCO or Pascal uh, or, or Kitty. And so the ability to take that data and generate multiple different types of uh, annotations from it allows allows you to really uh, tailor uh, your your experiments to um, to include a variety of different information based on these types of annotation that you that you provide. So when we're looking at synthetic data, uh, we really are mainly concerned with how it compares with the data that you're going to be actually uh, using your model to detect. So, you know, all simulation is really an approximation of reality, or maybe more accurately, sensors are kind of a measurement of reality, and simulate, simulation approximates those measurements using digital twins of sensors and scenarios and physics that are involved in capturing that image. So you know, no matter how uh, robust of a simulation we get, there is still going to be a bit of a domain gap or reality gap between um, you know, the, the simulated data that you have and the actual sensor-based data. There, there are going to be some, some unique uh, attributes about your sensor that you may not uh, capture within that within that estimation and that's that's uh you know true of, of any simulation so what we've found success with is actually using a gan based approach paired with the physics based simulation approach so uh, training a gan model to adapt a synthetic data data set uh, the, the characteristics of that synthetic data set to that of real data. So as you can see here on the left, this is the original synthetic data. And uh, on the right, we've we've taken that same image and adapted it to the specific data that we are interested in in classifying. So the the actual objects in that uh, in that scene have not changed in their location or, or their composition. But the, the characteristics of the image as a whole have have shifted a bit, and these are the types of things that get picked up when uh, when you're training an AI model to to detect objects. So the domain adaptation model we use is the the CycleGAN uh, approach. So that was developed in 2017. It's kind of the the OG uh, domain adaptation model that um, that kind of hit the scene uh, about five years ago. And uh, what's great about this approach is that it doesn't require matched pairs for training. So you can take a representative sample of real data uh, and train it to create an adaptation of your synthetic data, even though it's not a, an exact uh, representation of those same features that are found within the real images. So, um, another big benefit of it is that it, it, the translation occurs on edges that are found within the image. And what that provides is uh, a preservation of the overall feature shapes that are involved in your image. And from there, we can say that there's not really a change in, in the annotation that's required to, to represent those different objects that are found within the scene. So some of the considerations uh, you want to take into account when you're training a cycle can. Uh, one is that the the from set, the, the real data that you're you're feeding in to to train that that can model should be pretty extensive. So we're finding that around a, a thousand images provides the, the best result. And you can kind of see that in the uh, the image over here to to the right, um, where we have a, an example of thirteen hundred. Zebra, zebra images, uh, and this shows a pretty robust translation uh, adaptation. But when we get down into kind of the 250 to uh, less than 100 
scale, we we find a lot of kind of attenuation and and different um, to artifacts that are present within the scene. And similarly, you want to make sure that the the from and the to set data sets have those similar objects present that that you're interested in. So whether it be you know different types of houses or uh, you know features of a face, things like that, and those those objects should take up a, a similar amount of the image. So um, training a, a domain adaptation model, a, a cycle GAN on faces where some are you know, your from set is all very close up images of the face, whereas synthetic data has, you know, has images of the that are faces from, from a distance. Um, that wouldn't really work as well. So you want to make sure that they take a similar amount of the image. And then what we found is just that uh, training time takes a long time to train. So, and the training time is really more important than the total number of ep epics that uh, you train on because the the reason for that is that you know the more data you have maybe the fewer epics that you would really need to to uh, achieve so we're finding that between 24 and 48 gpu hours is really kind of the sweet spot for uh, getting a a model that is uh, effective but also doesn't like, overfit to uh, that data that you've got so the Render AI platform uh, allows for the ability to upload a trained CycleGAN model to the platform. And uh, the format that we, we use is this the PyTorch format found within this link here. And from there, what we can do is we can uh, take that pre-trained GAN and upload it to your rendered organization via our SDK. And then from there, it is really just a, a web interface or um, a API call to be able to uh, apply that GAN to your, your synthetic data sets um, as needed. And I'll show you a bit of this in, in the demo later on. So once we have that synthetic data and perhaps we've run a domain adaptation model on it, how do we assess the quality of it, or how do we assess the improvement uh, that the uh, domain adaptation model provided to our synthetic data? And you know, kind of the the gold standard or the the north arrow that you know you really want to look for is uh, does it improve my AP scores? But that's just kind of a, a single metric there, and it it doesn't necessarily highlight where the data has improved uh, it, what sorts of features have been included into the into the synthetic data where it can be improved what's what's maybe missing from that data so what we found is that viewing these data sets in embedding feature space uh, allows us to to really look at what features are found within each of these these images what sorts of things are is is an actual AI model picking up on. And then we can highlight the differences between clusters of features found in real images versus the, the clusters of, of features found in synthetic data. And if they, they don't quite overlap, then maybe there's some more work that we need to do in, those, in capturing those specific features. So how we use this is we uh, implement a UMAP design and UMAP is, uh, stands for Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. And it's really a, a way to uh, intelligently uh, reduce the dimensions of our data. So if we apply a CNN, uh, a convolutional neural network that includes a feature pyramid network, we can use the patterns found within those uh, reduced dimension spaces uh, and then reduce them further to uh, you know two or three dimensions, such that we can actually visualize those that, what what are really images in a two D or three D uh, space. So that's sort of the concept behind it. What we have here is uh, is kind of what that looks like in, in three dimensional space. So I'm going to 
open up the platform and uh, show you a bit of what, how to do this and, um, and what this really allows us to do with the data. All right, so here I am within the rendered AI platform. And so I have generated some data uh, using uh, what I'm interested in in this case is looking for cranes within satellite imagery. So I've, I've generated some, some synthetic data with these tower crane objects within various uh, RGB satellite imagery. So you can see that this is an example of some cranes. Uh, they've been uh, simulated to to match the the um, 2D backgrounds that they've been placed placed into these 3D assets uh, placed within these within these uh, backgrounds that include things like uh, time of day and location, so we can estimate the sun shadows. And the simulation has is able to match the type of distortion that is included within each of these backgrounds, but how does it really match up with the data that I want to use this model on? So uh, in this case, we want to use it on XView data. So XView is a, it's an open data set of satellite imagery that is uh, pretty widely used within the, the satellite imagery space. Uh, and what I've done is I've actually uploaded a, an existing set of real data to the platform. So uh, not only can you generate data within the platform. You can also upload existing real data sets uh, and, and then use those for analyses. So I've also applied a, a domain allocation model here. So if we here, see here, we, we can go to um, go to this GAN data sets tab here, and we can go and uh, provide an existing pre-trained GAN that I've uploaded to to my organization here. So I've done that already, and I've produced this GAN adapted model, the same data, but it's been uh, adapted using that process. So now I want to understand how this GAN adaptation, how it's affected the, the output data set, and whether that uh, has improved, improved the, the feature richness of my data. Um, and with that, what I can do is select these three data sets and click compare. And that will bring it to bring us to our UMAP analysis pane here. So we can uh, click on the, the XView data to use that as the fit data set. And then we can go ahead and click compare. So I've done that already over here in this tab. So here you can see the three dimensional plot output of the UMAP analysis. So what we can see here is that the blue dots represent our XView real data that we're looking to classify. The green dots represent our synthetic data that we've generated. Um, and then the yellow, the, the orange dots rather, are those synthetic data images that we've uh, applied the GAN model to. So you can see just off the right off the bat that the uh, green dots are very heavily clustered in this bottom right area, whereas the domain adapted dots, the, the, the images here, cover a much wider portion of the uh, of the real data set, of the, the embedding space of the real data. Set. So we can dig a bit deeper in there so we can see, okay, this is this, the images in these clusters they're pretty bright. Um, that's a domain adaptation, a domain ad adapted image. You can kind of see it's a bit more reddish, a bit darker, um, and that is kind of the the output, the the matched output of the real data that's, that's adapted that domain to. So you can see a bit darker, a bit redder, and that uh, is in line with some of these other images that are kind of a bit darker, a bit hazier, maybe. So some of the characteristics may be um, sensor-based, and uh, this is sort of the way to, to bridge that gap. We can also see over here that there's some images that are not within cluster at all within the real data set. And you can see in, in a lot of these images, it's, they're pretty dark. So we 
we may not really be uh, able to pull too many features out of that to begin with. Um, but that, or, or we may not really be be generating data that uh, is, is similar to this in this this sort of way. This these dark uh, regions. And you can also see maybe there's some areas of water that maybe we haven't captured here. So that is to say that if if we look at the the features that are out of cluster, you can really see trends in you know what sorts of features that exist uh, within the synthetic data and what sort of features do not. We can also change the feature size. So if you remember, we were using a feature pyramid network and reducing those dimensions using UMAP. So we can choose different levels of that feature pyramid, and that changes the output of our uh, of our 3D plot here. And you can kind of see it follows a similar trend, but maybe other certain uh, images will be outside of cluster in in uh, various feature feature pyramid levels that weren't before. So you can kind of pick out what's being captured and what is not. You can do that all the way down to, to um, 64 by 64. So that's kind of a taste of, of what we can do with domain adaptation, uh, what that, uh, what the effect of that is on our data, and then how we can use tools like UMAP to go in and then uh, analyze that data, find the features that exist within our synthetic data and those that do not, and better get a sense for how we can improve the synthetic data that we're generating to better match what we're looking to classify. And with that, I'll hand it back to Chris to conclude. All right, so thank you very much from the Rendered AI and the NVIDIA team for taking some time out of your day to uh, spend a few minutes and listening to us talk about synthetic data and the things you can do with Rendered AI and NVIDIA. And then, of course, we hope that you were able to follow along a bit and that you've been able to sign in and try out Rendered. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with any one of us. Uh, I've listed out our emails here, and we absolutely look forward to seeing you. And if you were in person at, uh, at CBPR. We hope that you enjoyed the show, and then if not, then we still hope that you uh, you you were able to uh, enjoy some technology that week as well. So take care, and and let us know if you have any questions. <laughs>